Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Another listener question episode. Thanks, sponsors. Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, and Panini Upper Deck and Tops. First question from Torsten Bauer from Germany, commenting on the value box, dollar box etiquette episode that Rich and I did. And uh, Torsten's a faithful listener, although he's in Germany, so he's going to respond according to his experience. He was relating that during a recent show, he was going through a value box organized by teams, and the box was labeled as a dollar box. So he found uh, several cards he liked. He pulled them, and then when he went to the the, the seller with the selections, the dealer said, uh, oh, these, these are worth more, and proposed a total of roughly uh, $2 a card. So he returned some of the cards to the box, says he haggled a bit on the ones that he kept, but it bothered him. It would bother me too, Torsten. <laughs> and I think uh, the etiquette is you didn't make a scene. And I think that's uh, to your credit, because I think just on the face of it, it just sounds bad. Now, is it a euro box as opposed to a dollar box or is it a dollar denominated box? Is there some way that something could be lost in the translation? I'm not sure. Was it a, a German dealer where it's a one German talking to another where there's not a language barrier? Europe is a whole nother uh, situation with the different nations that come together with a common currency. Torsten, you were an example of good etiquette, of not uh, making a, a scene there because I just think you were wronged. Again, maybe there's more to the story. Second one, also from Torsten. He was saying the precision of prices during the old days that Rich and I were talking about he says it stemmed from the widespread practice of adhering strictly to the book value in the Beckett magazines in most hobby shops, that it was a simpler time and the prices were universally accepted as the standard. And he says it's an evidence of remarkable trust <laughs> placed in our team's expertise. But frankly, let me just push back a little bit. Yes, I think all of that is true in one sense. But you have to realize that when we were doing these monthly price guides, if everybody strictly adhered, the next month, everything would be exactly the same. And so there was evidence each month, as you can see, historically, you can look back and look it up. But the down arrows were generally uh, cards that were, during that month, they were only able to be sold at a discount. So when that's evident in the market, then we uh, lowered the price because empirically the cards were selling for less. By the same token, the prices that went up from one month to the next, that was because some dealers, some kind of market-making dealers were successful in pushing the prices higher based on uh, player performance or player popularity or a set coming in more demand. It, it wasn't rigid. I, I think we were accurate, but by 30 days later, there had been enough changes that we could justify having a monthly publication. And now, of course, things going up more on a, almost on a daily basis, hourly basis. Third, from uh, Mookie Chilson about, again, the value box etiquette that Rich and I did. And he says it depends on the volume, that he doesn't think he works in the same volume as I do. I think my volume is higher than Rich's, and Rich's is probably higher than a lot of other people's. So he's negotiating after he, pick, after he picks out the cards. Okay, that's not what I'm going to address here. He says he tries to compile cards in increments of five or ten. That's just was interesting to me, Mookie. Uh, I do the opposite of that. I'm going to pick out what I'm going to pick out, but I'm not trying to hit an exact number. Uh, I think it begs the question, if you say, here are my $10 box cards, they're going to say, that'll be $10 because they don't have to do the math. But many times dealers are round down. It's one of the ways you can see if there's any potential for rapport with the dealer. Is the, you've got $6 cards. You're my $6 card. If you were to hold out a $5 bill, my guess is the dealer would probably take it. Or 11 or 12. I've got 12 cards here that are for a dollar. Many dealers are going to say, give me 10. Okay, so, or $106 cards. Are they really going to say that'll be $106? I actually have had that happen to me. The guy got his calculator out. But as Rich says, you just got to be prepared to pay the price. If you get a, a better deal than that, then so be it. Next again from Mookie Chilson. He says he works left to right, bottom to top. I work left to right, front to back. Okay. And he says he always asks the person if somebody's already at the box, that they mind. And, and that's awkward. I don't, my sports card insight here is that I, I really don't make it a priority to go to dealers that have one 
value box. I, I'm generally looking for uh, several. And uh, if it's only one box and somebody's there, I might wait or I might, I think it's rude to look over somebody's shoulders. So I don't do that too much, but I, I usually go where there's multiple boxes. And frankly, sometimes there's a crowd there, but if there's more boxes than people, I can find a box that nobody's looking at, which obviously I think is etiquette. Now, the other comment that comes up that I don't think people have asked me this, but if there's 10 dollar box cards, which one do I look at first? Now, generally, I'm going to start on the left, but if there's more than 10, I don't always start it at the left. I pick a box that I think is going to be most fruitful, and here's how I do it. So there's a whole bunch of boxes there, and the one that has the most top loaders I might start with that. If it's not top loaders, if there's a lot of card savers, okay? Might, and if not that, then it's penny sleeves. And if not, it's raw cards with nothing. There's two reasons for that. Number one, there's a perceived value that something ever top loaded or ever was put in a card saver. That means it, it might have had a little bit better value than a raw card or a penny sleeve card. And secondly, you just can go a lot faster. If it's in a top loader, you can go way faster than raw cards that stick together. Penny sleeves, you can go faster than raw cards, card savers faster. So it's speed and potentially perceived quality. On the other hand, I've got a whole bunch of extra top loaders and card savers now from going through that. Uh, next from, from Stooks, mentioning that he was going through a 1976 copy of Sports Collector's Digest, and he saw my status report for the price guide uh, survey that I did at the time. And I'm just saying, Stooks, my hat's off to you. If you're spending time, your spare time reading old hobby publications, that is impressive. <laughs> People want to know how you can get knowledge about what things used to be. Uh, you can get some old SCDs out there and read through them, and the, the ads are fascinating. Next, from my friend John Keating at that 70s show, and he's calling this a radical comment, but it's talking about the autograph arms race. And he's saying, don't blame fanatics or Panini or companies that they didn't create it. And John, you're blaming the consumer. And I think the consumer is part of the problem. It's not the whole problem, but we are, if not creating the demand, we are acquiescing to the main demand. So if collectors and serious collectors that love autographs were able to just say no or just say not now <laughs> or just say no not at that price all of those things are hard if not impossible for the very serious uh, passionate collector to say uh, so i think if they did then the onus would be on the players themselves and the players associations who are unionized to say we need to moderate our uh, pricing. But as long as collectors are paying the price, John, I think you're right there. That escalates the, the price. After all, the signature is just a signature. Okay, another one from, from John Keating, that 70s card show, another idea about some of the eBay selling of a dollar fifty nine card that somebody says uh, make an offer for a dollar, <laughs> and then the seller still has to cover shipping and the selling fees and all that stuff. He wind up with almost nothing. So he's suggesting a, a buyer's premium. Actually, I think if you really do the analysis, you're going to see that a buyer's premium on some of these auction sites, the higher uh, quality auctions, they have uh, buyer's premiums that if you buy, you're going to pay 20% more or 17% more, 23% more. If you're a sophisticated buyer, you're going to realize the price that you're paying that you win, it's going to be more. Plus it's shipping, plus insurance, plus any of these other things that you may have. I think eBay is not going to listen to John. It's not going to listen to me. But if you put uh, $1.59 cards out there and it's either auction or fixed price or make offer, OBO or best offer. So if you accept it, then that's what you're doing. It points out that the tricky thing in this industry is there's people that make money selling cheaper cards. Rob Varis is doing great with comments. Yeah. Okay, next, Bob Booth talking about the Pro Football Hall of Fame semifinalists. He's, he's saying it's going to be Antonio Gates, Julius Peppers, James Harrison, Anquan Bolden, Steve Smith, and Andre Johnson. Okay, all those guys are hobby if you looked at those guys compared to the other uh, 19 or so, whatever it is there, these are the more well-known anyway. They have a following, but I just don't think the Pro Football Hall of Fame is looking at the, the interest uh, from collectors. And I don't know that they even should. It's basically how they performed on the field, not how they form, perform with their cardboard. But those are the ones I'd gravitate to, Bob, as well. And I think those guys probably will get in, whether they get in immediately or eventually, like I said, the, the, the idea with the, any of these uh, Hall of Fame 
possibilities are to get ahead of it. <laughs> Don't wait till they get elected. When you get, they get elected, it's going to be a bump. So if you think these are good bits, I've already seen some bits. I sell on eBay and I sell on ComC, and I've already seen some interest in each one of those players, Bob. So I, I think you're right on. And then lastly, from Ken Kinsley, Beans Ball Card blog, talking about James Harris and why he thinks he will get in. It's because if you are a noteworthy defensive stalwart on the Steelers and you play – play there for a long time. He says there's no better franchise to be loved if you're a defensive player. And that kind of has been true. I don't know if it'll be true forever, but it's true for right now. Like I said, I like it when a player stays with a franchise for a long time, whether it's the Cowboys or any franchise. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, uh, John. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Torsten, as well. Everybody that commented here, I'm gradually getting through the comments and enjoying that. It's that time toward the end of the year where, where I'm just catching up with things. So, again, thanks a lot. It's been a great year, and I'll be commenting on that as well. But uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks for your questions. Keep sending them to Dr. James Beckett at gmail.com, and that's just spelled out every word. No spaces, no dashes, no nothing. Just Dr. James Beckett at gmail.com. So, Thanks, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year. The man